six, five, four, three. Greetings. It's once again a real pleasure to be here and to have you here. Before we begin the presentation today, I would like, as we always do, go to the Lord in prayer. Our blessed and lovely Father, again, we are in your presence, aware that thy Holy Spirit have descended to lead this study. We pray that holy angels will accompany us and that our minds would be ready to receive the instruction that comes from above. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. One of the things that uh, had of mentioned very often was the fact that uh, the church needed to be protected, and in order to protect the, protect the church, he thought that ad, un, unfaithful Adventists have to be eliminated. So today we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how the church is going to be not only protected but also how the church is going to be purified. I would like to begin reading chapter seven from Revelation. And in chapter 7 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom he was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So there's going to be a lot of hurting by these angels in Revelation 7. They're going to be hurting the earth the sea, and the trees. So how is the people of God, how are the people of God going to be protected? And in uh, Testimonies to Ministers, page 445, there's a very interesting uh, quotation from Ellen G. White in that uh, particular book. How is the Lord going to protect his people, his beloved church, John sees the elements of nature. He saw earthquakes, tempests, but he also saw something else. He saw political strife represented as being held by the four angels. So I want you to notice this very carefully. Is natural disasters like earthquakes, like um, uh, all kind of storms, okay? and uh, being held, but also political strife. These winds, says she, are under control until God gives the word to let them go. There is the safety of God's church. In other words, who's in control? God is in control. Therefore, nothing is going to happen to the church that God would not allow it to. Now, that uh, concept, political strife, what is that making reference to? Well, you know that uh, in politics, uh, it's in the Senate and the House where they approve or sign laws or not. So what kind of law do you think that would be uh, affecting Seventh-day Adventists more than any other law, the Sunday law. So what Sister White is saying in reality is that the Lord is holding back by holding the winds. He is not allowing the Sunday law to be signed. And there's got to be a reason for it. Uh, 
uh, Revelation 7, 3, again, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. See, God does not have to kill to cleanse the church, but he indeed has to cleanse the church. There's no way that the latter rain can uh, be bestowed upon a church that is still contaminated with tears. But the Lord is not going to have to kill anybody in order to purify the church. So this particular quotation now is very, very, very important. And uh, it has been misunderstood by many. And here's the reason why. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God. What is the seal of God for? For protection. The people are going to be sealed before the winds are let go. So indeed, I mean, you, you don't have to be a rocket sa scientist to, to see that, that the seal in the, in the forehead uh, by, by, by God is for protection, is to protect the church. But not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. Now, the following statement is real serious because it says it is left with, with us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. So you see, God's work is a combination of mankind and divinity. Mankind must cooperate with the Spirit of God for the sanctification of their souls. And there's many of the brothers and sisters that approach me after I finish this particular presentation and ask me, how is it that we are going to contribute? Well, it's very simple. I mean, remember the young uh, rich ruler when he went to Jesus? And after Jesus told him what he had to do in order to join them, he said that that, that, that was, it's impossible. I have too much money. I'm not going to give my money to the, to the poor. And the disciples said, you know, Lord, if it is the way that you told this young man, I mean, who can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible for man is possible for God. And Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do how many things? I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So it shouldn't be any problem with that. Uh, unless we do not want those pats or wrinkles to be removed, they will be removed. We are the ones who decide, who choose to have the defects removed. Amen. We pray, and God is going to answer. I mean, he is, uh, he is willing to empty the whole heaven of angels, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit is, is at, our, at our disposition. He's just waiting for us to, to ask, and the Lord is going to cleanse us. And you'll see why we got to be cleansed first in a minute. Then the latter rain will fall upon us. You see the connection? It is clearly stated. As long as there are defects in our character, the latter rain is not going to be poor. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then... Not until then, the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. And from there on, brothers and sisters, the gospel is going to go into all the world. And it's not going to take a long time. It's going to be directed by the Spirit of God. So 
this seven presentation is about the purification of the church. How is the church going to be purified? Well, had I've had the idea, uh, a, 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 a distorted idea of, of purification. According to it, he had of God was going to purify the church by a slaughtering of all those that refused to listen and accept his idea. In his mind, the Seventh-day Adventist church was in a state of apostasy since 1930, and the only way to put a remedy to her condition was by wiping out all the infidels in the church. Whether it's going to be done by angels or whether it's going to be by divisions, the fact still remains that Victor Haddoff had the idea that it was going to be through a slaughter. By infidels, he meant those Seventh-day Adventists that rejected the theories of the shepherd's rod. His call to the church was to repent or die. Nothing else. It's so clearly stated in the, in, in the gospel according to Luke, chapter 19, verse 10. The Son of God came to seek and to save that which was lost. I mean, God doesn't want the, the wicked to be lost. Otherwise, had he spared, you know, had he, had he not spared his own son, you know, to die for humanity? So what kind of a God is, is it that, that the Davidians are projecting, you know, presenting to the people? The picture presented by the shepherd's rod leader is one of little, if any, hope. It pictures God as a revengeful, merciless, cruel being. The picture is not different than the one the evangelicals and Protestants present in regards to the idea of hell. I mean, you know that that idea was developed during the Dark Ages. And the church in those days wanted to make sure that everybody look up to the church. And if they're not going to do it uh, by understanding, then we're going to do it one way or the other. So they developed this idea of hell, you know, a place where people are going to remain alive a place where everybody is going to be immortal. They're not going to die. They're going to have eternal life, but they're going to be in a lake of fire, suffering, screaming, feeling pain. I mean, give me a break so I live 15, 20, 50 years, 100 years up on this earth, and then God is going to keep me in a place burning, Throughout eternity? I mean, what kind of a God would that be? That would be a very cruel God. So now he comes with this other idea. You know, if you don't listen to what the so-called prophet of God is telling you, so then God is going to slaughter you. So you either listen or else. That was the position of uh, Victor Haddoff. You see, the Jesus I know is a merciful, loving, kind, patient, long-suffering. The Bible says that he is consuming fire, but it's defined as a strange work that people are going to bring upon themselves because of the poor choices that they make in their lives. Lift him up, page 28. Satan had charged upon God the attributes he himself possessed. Isn't that what, what the devil always tried to do? I mean, he portrays God the way that he behaved. Now in Christ, he saw God revealed in his true character, a compassionate and merciful father, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to him in repentance and have eternal life. The way that I picture the destruction of the wicked is as follows. See, God does not intend to destroy any of the wicked. He doesn't want to. 
but the wicked did not want to part with sin. So God's intent is to destroy sin. But because the wicked ones embraced sin so closely, they didn't want to get rid of it. When the fire comes down from heaven to destroy sin, those that were embracing sinful life would be destroyed. Not because God wanted to destroy them, but because they were not willing to accept the salvation that God was offering to them. Amen. Does God want a church without blemish? Of course he does. Indeed, without spot or wrinkle. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. In the previous verses says, women, you know, wives submit to your husbands. But when it comes to the husbands, he is serious. He doesn't say just love your wives. He says love them and he qualifies. And this is the problem, that he qualifies the way that we husbands are to love our wives. And he says, love your wife even as Christ also loved the church. What was he willing to do for the church? Die for it. Die for it. I mean, I don't know that many husbands that are willing to die for their wives. I mean, there's so many of them when I was still pastoring and and they would come, you know, uh, pastor, I mean, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, is, is there any solution for the situation? I, I want to break it up, but I don't want to be lost. It's sad. But the Bible is clear. Yet, if we do not allow the Holy Spirit to develop the character, the mind of Christ in our hearts, we will not be able to love our wife the way that Christ loved the church. And that is the problem. We have to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus. And once you submit yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit, then once you possess Christ's mind, you will think like Christ. You will act like Christ. You will love like Christ. Even in the cross, he did not want those people to be destroyed. I mean, they're killing him, and still he's begging the Father, forgive them not. They, they don't know what they're doing. Please give them another chance. Man, loving Jesus. How can you present Jesus in a different matter? That he speaking about Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. He is going to purify the church himself if the church only allows him to do it. That he can present it to himself, a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Just let him work in you. Purification or sanctification is a lifelong process. It's not anything that is going to happen in five, ten minutes, or seven days like Haroff said. During seven days, there's going to be angels slaughtering seven-day Adventists that did not want to receive the message of the shepherd's rod. Those who profess to be disciples of Christ should be elevated in all, in all their thoughts and acts and should ever realize that they are fitting for immortality. This is the training ground, planet Earth. And that if saved, they must be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Their Christian character must be without 
a blemish, or they will be pronounced unfit to be taken to a holy heaven to dwell with pure, sinless beings in God's everlasting kingdom. It's like I told you one time. Why was Satan kicked out of heaven? Because of rebellion. He was proud. He was selfish. He was full of spots and wrinkles. So because he was so rebellious, he was cast out of heaven. So can you imagine now what Satan would do if Jesus would come in a second time and have a church filled up with rebellious individuals to be taken to heaven? What do you think that Satan would say? How can you forgive these people and allow them to go to heaven and you cast me out of there? That is impossible. Then everything that I said about you, that you are a merciless God, was true. You're not impartial. You're leaving me down here and you're going to destroy me while you're taking all these bunch of rebels to heaven. So many of us think uh, it's, it's okay and we hear some very soft presentations in which, you know, if you, if you just come to Jesus and if you, if you just accept him, it'll be okay. There's nothing else that you have to do. No, 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 no. You accept Jesus in your heart, with all your heart. And once you accept him, now he's going to dress you up with his garment of righteousness. So he wants you to keep that garment of righteousness spotless. And he's not putting all the burden upon you. He's telling you the Holy Spirit is going to help you on your way. All you have to do is don't try to do it yourself. Let us do it for you. And if we do that, then we would not have any problems. Purification is not the problem. See how I spoke about purification. That's not the problem. Cleansing is a biblical concept. Is, is it or not? Of course it is. I mean, we see it throughout the, throughout the Bible. If it were possible for us to be admitted into heaven as we are, how many of us would be able to look upon God? Doesn't the Bible says that sin makes separation between us and God? So do you think that you would be able to look at God at any time? Not without being destroyed. How many of us have on the have on the wedding garment? How many of us are without spot or wrinkle or any such thing? This is not me speaking. This is the Spirit of God. Okay? This is our washing and ironing time. This is what Sister Wise says. The time when we are to cleanse our robes of character, where? In the blood of Jesus. There's no other way. Without Jesus, we would be nothing. We, we would be hopeless. There's no way that we can aspire to live in the kingdom of God if it wasn't for Jesus' precious blood. John says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Shall we not let our sins go? The problem is not the cleansing, it's the method advocated by the Davidians. That is the problem. Huta wrote, in Ezekiel chapter 9, is envisioned the marking of those who sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof, and the slaughter of those who do not thus sigh and cry. This prophecy of purification by slaughter has never been fulfilled. But we saw last night, if you remember to go home and read 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 12 on, it tells you clearly that Ezekiel 9, 
took place, was fulfilled literally, locally. But Ezekiel 9 is going to have another fulfillment. The first one was local. It was in Jerusalem with the nation of, uh, of Israel. But the second fulfillment is going to be universal, global. It's going to be the seven last place. Although the marking and the slaughter include only the church, the hurting by the winds and the hurting by the angels include all the world. Sihadov chose the wrong concepts and he used the wrong wording to define what he had in mind. Instead of pursuing a state of purity by grace through faith or what the Bible advocates as sanctification, how to promote a state of purity by elimination. Forget about the process of sanctification. The church is not going to listen. Kill them all. Slaughter them. Get them out of the way. Not the elimination of sin by the leading and grace of the Spirit of God, but rather the elimination of the sinner. Now we have heard this so many times. God hates sin, but he loves the sinners. As a matter of fact, heaven is going to be filled of repentant sinners. Why? Because the Lord loves them. He doesn't want the destruction of the wicked. He wants to save them. As one considers the bitterness that Harov developed as a result of his misunderstanding at the Glendale Sanitarium, it's not difficult to think that he was allowing his feelings to interfere with, with his doctrinal issues. Remember, he didn't receive VIP treatment in the hospital, the Adventist hospital, so the Adventist church is wrong with everything. Now, Ezekiel 9 and Revelation 7 are taken out of context by Harov. You remember that Sister Y says in page 445, Testimonies to Ministers, that what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 9, the vision of Ezekiel 9, is similar to what John saw in the vision of Revelation 7. In one of them, there's five, in Ezekiel 9, there's five angels that do all the hurting, okay? But in Revelation 7, there's only four. So it's not the symbol that is important, but it's the event that we really, really have to uh, zero in. The main object of the sealing or marking of the servants of God is to cleanse the church from sin and sinners so that she may be able to stand strong against the image beast in the time of trouble. And that when this purifying work is completed, it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Harav's idea is, if they do not repent, kill them, slaughter them. At the first sight of rebellion in heaven, God could have cleansed heaven immediately. He didn't have to allow sin to proliferate. Could have just eliminate Lucifer. And of course, his character would have been uh, in question from there on. Because God is a just God, but he is also a merciful God. See, on Calvary, justice and mercy kiss each other. It's a wonderful figure that Sister White uses. Will the church be purified? Of course the church is going to be purified. It will go through a process of purification, but not in the fashion understood by Victor Harov and the Davidians. It will not be by slaughtering. I promise you that. For many, in many times, in many occasions, they have foretold that the slaughter was going to take place in 1959. Well, Harov said initially that it was going to be in 1930 when the church 
fell from the, from the grace of God. Then his wife said that it was going to be in 1959. Then Benjamin wrote and said that it was going to take place in 1960. Then from there on, after they separated in groups everywhere and they installed uh, Mount Carmel centers and there were prophets all over the place, then each one of them have their own interpretation, their own dates, and their own uh, uh, future events. They all wanted to be prophets. They all wanted to be important. They all want to have power. And that is the problem. I mean, to the point that Lois Roden says that she had a vision after 1978 when her husband, Benjamin Roden, died. And she says later on that in the vision, she, she, she saw that the Holy Spirit is a female. And they want to have something new so that people can look at them in a, in a different way. And then Jamie uh, Bingham in Exeter, Missouri, on the Bayesian camp, the other Mount Carmel, she uh, claimed that she was the impersonation of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, according to what Lois Roden said, was a female. So now Jamie is the impersonation of the Holy Spirit. There are three areas to be cleansed. The heavenly sanctuary have to be cleansed, yes or no? Of course, Daniel 8, 14. I mean, that is, that is a very, uh, not prominent, but intimate doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We can say that that is probably the major contribution of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to Christianity. That is the purification, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, the church on planet Earth, does it have to be cleansed, yes or no? Of course it has to be cleansed. I mean, we read it. The Lord is going to purify it. It will have no spot, no wrinkle. How about the soul temple? Does it have to be purified too? Of course it has to be purified. So how are the heavenly sanctuary, the church on Earth, and the soul temple contaminated? Unconfessed sins contaminate the soul temple and the church. Do we agree on that? Amen. Of course. Unconfessed sins. As long as there is sin in the church and the people do not want to separate themselves from sin, the church is considered polluted, contaminated. But the heavenly sanctuary is contaminated by confessed Sins. It's not the sins that we have not confessed which is going to pollute the heavenly sanctuary. It's when we confess our sins, then it goes to the most holy place so that Jesus makes atonement for those sins. Amen. That's how this, the, holy, the, the heavenly sanctuary is contaminated. So the church, and the church and the soul temple are contaminated in a way, but the heavenly sanctuary is contaminated in a different way. So in order to cleanse the church and the soul temple, we have to separate ourselves from sin. In order to cleanse the heavenly sanctuary, we have to be completely exempted from sin. As long as we continue to have sin in our lives and continue to confess those sins, we are contaminating the temple of God. Are we in agreement here? All right. Spiritual gifts, second volume, page 284. There's four elements of purification, of cleansing, that the Lord is going to use in order to separate the wheat from the tares. And she says there, the shaking must soon take place to purify the church. What is going to take place? It doesn't say slaughtering, brothers and sisters. 
What does it say there? A shaking. I don't know if you if you ever been in in a farm when they are uh, uh, reaping, when they are uh, harvesting. And uh, I remember that I went to a farm in in Jersey, New Jersey. And that farmer had a, a tractor, and he was an engineer, so he 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 installed this kind of arm. And in that arm, it had like like uh, two, two bows arc, arch, you know, that hydraulically he would close them in the trunk of the tree and he would shake the tree and then the men were there to collect, you know, the peaches, the apples, whatever it was, and those that were soft, what happened to them? They fell. But those that were solidly attached to the branches of the tree did not fall. They stayed there. So the shaking must soon take place to purify the church. What brings the shaking into the Seventh-day Adventist church? Not a slaughtering. Four elements of purification or shaking of the church are, number one, Sister White says, the straight testimony of the true and faithful Witness. And where do we find that in the Bible? Revelation. In Revelation. Revelation 3. And if we go to Revelation 3, we're going to find the following. Look what it says. It says in verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Who is this? It's Jesus. He is the faithful witness. I know thy works. You're not going to fool me that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That is the message of the true witness. Does he know what the condition of the church is? Of course he knows. He knows what's going on in the church. I mean, I repeat it. 2,000 years ago, he spoke about the parable of the wheat, and the tears. So for 2,000 years, the church should have understand what the problem is. Because it wasn't until the people in the church, the servants, that he left in charge, the stewards, it wasn't until they fell asleep that the devil was able to plant the wrong seed in the church. So the straight testimony of the true and faithful witness, I know your works. Does works count? Yes, they do. As long as you don't put a uh, uh, cart before the horses. See, you can't work in the line or according or in harmony with the Holy Spirit until you have met Jesus, until you fell in love with Jesus, until you are enamored with Jesus, until you consider Jesus the best thing in your life, you can't work along with the Holy Spirit. That is the first thing, is an encounter with Jesus is falling in love with Jesus. And after you fall in love with Jesus, then you are ready to begin your works. Early writing 270, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Some will not bear the straight testimony. They want to listen to a 
God loves you in spite of anything. It doesn't make any difference. You can live a life in which you're going to hit a bottom and a still. Don't worry about it. And how many times you fall and the Lord is going to rescue you. Partially that is truth. It's true. The Lord is willing to rescue us. But it comes to a point. I mean, it already happened to Esau. And the spirit of prophecy and the Bible itself says that with tears, then he wanted to repent. But what happened? He had grieved the spirit of God. And there was no way to repent. It happened to Judas. So we can't play with our salvation. Don't joke with your salvation. Don't play games. This is a serious matter. We're either going to make it or not. So some of the Laodiceans don't like when a pastor that understands what is his responsibility, that do not want to, to carry with, with the guilt, the blood of those that he did not share the true gospel with them. He doesn't want to carry it over their back. So some of us go to some of the churches and we preach the straight testimony. And we tell the people the reality. And the reality is that you must cooperate with the Holy Spirit. God cannot and will not. Well, he can if he wants to, but he's, he would have to stop being God. God will not force anyone into the kingdom of God. See, the Bible says that God cannot lie. And that's why the, the straight testimony, I know your condition. You think that you are rich and increasing goods and all those things, but I know the problem and the situation is that you are poor and blind and naked. And he says, I counsel to you, buy from me without money. I'm not going to even charge you. Just come to me. Tell me that you want to buy gold. That is love, uh, love and faith. Tell me that you want garment, the righteousness of Jesus. Tell me that you want eyesal, collyrium, so that your eyes will be able to see. But not even because the Lord Jesus is willing to give it for free are some of us willing to buy. You see, the message to the Laodiceans is fine in paper or verbalized. But when it comes to practice, second element, Sunday law, the mark of the beast system, five te testimonies, page 82. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conform to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threaten, imprisonment, and probably death. In this time, in what time? What is the mark of the beast system? Is the time when the Sunday laws are not going to be just signed, but they will be enforced. And that is the situation. I mean, we have blue laws in the United States of America. There are blue laws in Israel. Did you know that, that there's blue laws in Israel? When I went to Germany, there were blue laws in there. And the brethren told me, you can't do this and this and this and this on Sunday. When I lived in Jersey, one of the brothers, one of the members of the church, he was a welder, and he closed up his shop. And he thought, you know, no one is going to know. So he welded some work that he wanted to get it out. On Sunday, and he ended up having to pay a hundred bucks because one of the neighbors complained. In this time, when the Sunday law is enforced, okay, the gold will be separated from the dross. Where? 
Not in the world. It's in the church. It's in the church. And I mean, it's written. There's no way that we can avoid what the Spirit is trying to communicate to the church. And he's doing it for our own benefit. God wants to save us, but he cannot save us in our sins. He wants to save us from our sins. The time is coming when we cannot sell at any price. The decree will soon go forth, prohibiting men to buy or sell of any man save him that hath the mark of the beast. We came near having this realized in California a short time since. That was in 1982. But this was only the threatening of the blowing of the four winds. Do you see what I told you before? The four winds preventing. The angels are preventing the winds from blowing. And those winds are a representation not only of the natural disasters, but also the Sunday law. As yet, they are held by the four angels. We are not just ready. Why is it that the Sunday law is not being signed? Because the church is not ready. So the Lord is not going to allow this country. And that's why, you know, many of the brothers and sisters say, well, you know why so-and-so had to become president of the state. Listen, God is in control. Amen. Don't try to tell God how to manage his business. He knows better than all of us. Whatever he allows, he's got a reason for it. So learn to live with it. We are not just ready. There is a work yet to be done, and then the angels will be bidden to let go that the four winds may blow upon the earth. Then the time of, of trouble will come. Before that time of trouble comes, brothers and sisters, make sure that we have the seal of the living God. Third element of purification, the work of health reform is the Lord's means for lessening suffering in our world and for purifying the church. There's lots of organizations out there. Lots of organizations out there which are keeping the health reform better than we Adventists are. It's sad. The Lord wanted us to be head. Not tail. I mean, he told uh, the Israelites, look, this, 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 is, this is so interesting. In the book of Genesis, find out, read how much land God promised to Abraham. He said, from the Mediterranean all the way to the Gulf, that's going to be yours. From all the way from the Euphrates to the, to the, to the uh, north of Egypt, all that is going to be yours. I mean, this has proven to be the richest part of the world. But what happened? They became lazy. As soon as they enter, you know, uh, on the east of the Jordan, and, and immediately Reuben says, you know, uh, um, you know we, just, we just took all these people out of there and look at those houses. They're already, they're already uh, uh, built. And can, can, can we stay here? on this side of Jordan, and then you guys can go and continue conquering the land. Joshua said, uh-uh. If you don't go and help, you don't inherit here or there. So he had to go. But they got tired. They got lazy. They lost faith. It's sad. What are we doing today? Are we also tired? And going back, retreating back to Egypt? Isn't that what the, the Israelites wanted to do? We miss those pots. Oh, man, that tasty that tasty pots of food. I mean, it always been a problem, you know, with God's children. Appetite, it's, it's a problem. 
Yeah, and we don't, we don't learn to recognize that. Uh, the Lord work, the work of health reform is the Lord's means for lessening suffering in our world and for purifying the church. It is impossible for those who give the reins to appetite to attain to Christian perfection. The moral and vigorous action of the higher powers of the mind are essential to the perfection of Christian character. Fourth element, the introduction of false doctrines. Examples, the Davidians. I mean, that's what we've been talking about for, this is what, the seventh presentation. But there's also the Reformed Church. That is the German Reformed Church and also the Reformed Church in the United States when they split it. The Reformed Church split it in 1951 and then they had the, the United States uh, part of the Reformed Church and then the German uh, Reformed Church. Then there's some gentleman that I heard a lot lately, Ratzlaff Life Assurance Ministries. Then is the Smyrna Gospel out of Virginia. These are the people that promote that there's no such a thing as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. According to them, the Holy Ghost does not exist, and Christ is not God. He is just the Son of God, someone that God brought forth. This is the way that they put it. And it's sad. Why it's so sad? Because they're, I mean, they have membership in Dominican Republic. They have membership in Central America, in South America. In the United States, I mean, there's magazines left and right. There's DVDs. There's CDs all over the place. I went to Miami to do a presentation, and there I have to, I have to meet these anti-Trinitarians. God will arouse his people if other means fail. Heresies will come in among them. You see why the Lord allowed this Davidian individual to bring all those heresies to the church? Heresies will come in among them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. Just like with the Sunday law, all those that are half converted in the church, all those that are nothing but cowards, the minute that they see the persecution, they're going to say, uh-uh, I don't want anything to do with it. I'm walking out of here. They don't want to suffer. They don't want to go to jail. They don't want to be without food. They don't want to be without money. They don't want to depend on the Lord. So therefore, when the Sunday law is signed up, out they go, and they will join the ranks of the enemy. We shall meet with false doctrines of every kind, and unless we are acquainted with what Christ has said and are following his instruction, we shall be led astray. When the shaking comes by the introduction of false theories, these surface readers anchor nowhere are like shifting sand. They slide into any position to suit the tenor of their feelings of bitterness. Although she, the church, must meet heresies and persecutions, although she must battle with the infidel and the apostate, yet by the help of God she is bruising the head of Satan because God has faithful people in the church the Lord will have a people as true as steel and with faith as firm as the granite rock those who are living upon the earth when the intersection of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of the sprinkling. Through the grace of God, not by themselves, we do not deserve to enter the kingdom of God. But because God loves us so much, through the blood of Jesus, we will have the opportunity to be there. 
through the grace of God and their own diligent effort. You love God, now you work along with God. See, God is not going to do for us what we can do for ourselves. They must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigated judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification. Putting away of sin among God's people upon earth is not that there's going to be a slaughtering. You don't have to be afraid of the slaughtering. You should be, you should have so much faith faith, so much faith, when you read how much effort heaven is doing, is making, so that we can be saved. I mean, please. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation 14. The church triumphant, when this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be, be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Then the church, listen to this. I mean, I, I sometimes become emotional when I read this statement from Sister White. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. Then the church, what church? the Seventh-day Adventist church. Not the church militant, but the church triumphant. Because those that were uh, militant and did not cooperate with God in the purification of their souls will walk away from the church. It's not that God is going to cast them away. It's that they're going to walk away from the church, they themselves. God didn't want him to leave, but he can't do anything to stop him. Then she will look forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners, conquering, conquering. May God bless us, and may we be part of that triumphant church. Shall we pray? A blessed and lovely Father, once again, you have been so gracious to us, giving us such important information. Oh, Father, help us to keep it in our hearts and to be willing to surrender everything into your hands. For we ask it all in Jesus' beautiful name and to his sake. Amen. Amen. May God bless you all. We hope that you come back tomorrow for the next presentation.